Uh, well, I guess good afternoon to everybody starting on the East Coast, uh, not on the West Coast, but, uh, you know, uh, I've been working with load handling equipment, obviously, um, in my military career and uh, for the last 30 years uh, in my uh, safety career, uh, starting in, you know, high as environmental working through construction uh, and emergency response type things. And I've worked with things up to 600 ton cranes. Uh, down to one of my favorites is chain falls, uh, and these aren't mentioned much uh, in what we're going to talk about, but I've had more incidents with lifting with chain falls uh, in my career and in things with 20,000 pounds and less uh, than I've ever had with cranes, but I've had incidents with cranes too, and most of the incidents I've ever experienced with cranes are either when we reconfigure them, uh, redo them or, or during maintenance activities, which is interesting. And I may talk about a couple of those as, as we go through this. Uh, if we start looking through references and regulations, you know, we've got our own SOP 0405 on hoisting and crane operations that we rely on. Uh, for those of us who are covered under EM 3D 5-1-1, you can get pieces from section 14, material handling and storage, pieces from rigging, uh, and mainly what we're going to focus on is kind of run within how section 16 is set up as far as how this presentation go, which is load handling equipment itself. Um, in the OSHA regulations, you can go to subpart G and H and, you know, subpart CCs, material handling, helicopters, hoist. You know, we could probably spend two or three days going through all those references and details, but we've got an hour. So we're going to kind of go through this pretty quickly to what we have. Uh, on the definition side, you just go through a couple quickly. Uh, if we go in 385-1-1, there's probably five or six different definitions for a competent person, but they're basically the same. You know, when it comes to cranes and rigging, uh, you know, the competent person has to have the ability, the training, the education, uh, and the ability to make changes out there in a the field. There's no real change to that. Um, there's probably several different definitions for a crane, depending on what type of crane it is. But the basic definition is a machine for lifting or lowering a load and moving it horizontally with the hoisting mechanism being an integral part of the machine. That's the basics there. Um, we'll see things on cribbing as we go through the presentation today. Uh, basically, we use a lot of cribbing. We're talking about putting together lattice cranes or if we're going to place a boom all the way down and lay it on something, you might put it on top of cribbing. Um, critical lift, uh, in a general term, we usually look at that as 75% greater than the load, but you'll find out if we go into details, you know, in section 16 of 385, there are several different instances where something is gonna be considered a critical lift. And we'll get to that later on in the presentation. Uh, derricks, we don't see these a lot, uh, but we'll show you what a derrick looks like. Uh, basically, it's something else that can lift, uh, and we'll show you what that really looks like. Uh, load handling equipment itself, uh, it describes cranes, hoists, other hoisting equipment. You know, a lot of times I see us using, you know, what I call cherry picker cranes, lattice cranes, uh, forklifts, uh, basic forklifts, extended boom form forklifts. Uh, and other equipment, excavators, a lot to, to do that is load handling. Uh, and the term qualified person also comes up with a competent person uh, who is basically a little bit more knowledgeable than a competent person and has the ability to solve or resolve problems. So those definitions don't change. When we talk about different types of load handling equipment, you know, you've got your, your cranes, your lattice, your crawlers, your wheeled cranes, uh, ringer mounted cranes, uh, portal tower and pillar cranes. We'll show you examples of those as we go through this. Uh, we do have floating pieces of equipment that we use, you know, to make lifts with. Uh, there's monorails and underhung cranes. We talked about derricks. Um, I've been around long enough where I've seen a lot of lifts done with helicopters. Uh, I used to work with a company called Pullman where we did chimney work a lot on the fossil plants. And those chimneys can be up a thousand feet high. And they usually have some type of mechanism way on the top that has to be taken out if you're gonna demo it or if you're gonna refurbish it. Uh, but the only way to really get to it is through an aircraft. And those are very extensive type lifts. Um, they get into 
having to notify the FAA to have an expensive plan. You know, you've got the people in the helicopter, you've got police on the ground, you've got all kinds of things that have to happen when you have a rotocraft involved. Uh, forklifts we'll touch on. Um, I know here at the Camp Lejeune, because of the work we're doing right now, you know, we've got a lot of pile drivers uh, that we've been using. Uh, you know, your basic excavators, uh, backhoes, those kind of things. Uh, supported personnel platforms. I don't know if any of you used these before, but if you look down at the bottom left down there, that's a mass climber. Uh, I've used those in a past life with building envelope work in New York City, Florida, uh, where you're going to repair the sides of the building, put new windows in, all that kind of stuff. And these can carry a lot of weight, but there's also a lot of weight loads that you have to adhere to depending on how those are configured. And you might see things like personnel lifts, you know, outside of buildings where we've got elevators on the outside or swing shifts, if anybody ever used a swing shift. Um, and there's also personnel hoists. I know when I did the chimney work, you know, some of those we, we'd have an area we were working in that might be 300 feet up, it might be 500 feet up, but to get everybody to that location, we would have a setup where we would bring everybody up through the center of the chimney and basically a personnel hoist that may have up to one to three people in it. You can see the little cylindrical tubes uh, that you can step into and haul them up. That's always fun, uh, especially if you're not really fond of heights. Um, we talk about personnel qualifications. Obviously, we need people operating their train qualified and certified. Uh, when you come to areas like cranes and, and forklifts, it's very clear in the OSHA standards. People have to be trained and certified. They also have to be able to have written tests, uh, and they also have to have um, uh, practical tests, meaning hands-on with that specific piece of equipment that you're going to be using. Now, you know, from a standpoint of what we need to do, we need to provide representation of what those qualifications are, especially when we're under E385-1-1 and we get to things like having a crane and a competent person, a lot of times we're going to have to put that information in with the AHA submittal as we go through it. Um, there's also provisions both in the OSHA standards and EM385 uh, where you can do kind of OJT training as long as it's under supervision um, of a qualified operator and you have a, a right system in place. Uh, again, there is some state licensing that goes in there, especially with crane operators that we have to do. Oh. Oh. Let me silence my phone and put that away. Anyway, apologize. Um, okay. Uh, tr crane operator testing. Uh, the way the OSHA standards changed a few years back, uh, you know, you've got your national accreditations like the NCCCO, which is probably the most recognized, especially for train for cranes. Uh, but again, all of them talk about written and practical testing when it comes to specifically to crane operators. But that should also be the norm if we've got an excavator operator, front end loaders. There's got to be some type of process that we have or that we push down to our subcontractors and make sure that they have. You know, that makes sure that we do have qualified operators out there because that's what can get us in trouble more than anything else. Uh, there is a provision in the OSHA standards for an OSHA approved employer program. You probably won't see this except for very large construction companies where it makes sense. And they probably have like when I was with Shaw Group and we did construction, we were building power plants, coal plants, gas plants. I ended up building the first two nuclear plants in the uh, in the company in VC Summer and Bogle, you know, we had a group of about 15 people and they did nothing but crane lifts and set them up and went out to the projects and made sure, especially when we were doing critical lifts, because uh, when you've got a project to that side, you may have 15 different size cranes running every day on a project. So it's a lot to go through. Uh, and the other provisions are in there or training that's conducted in the military that can transcend outside to that after people leave the military. Um, crane operator requirements, obviously, you know, if we're talking about EM-385, excuse me, go back one, um, we typically have to put the designations in the AHA with the name of the person and the qualifications need to be submitted with that. Um, you know, it is written in oral, oral operational testing, um, you know, 
Also, with crane operators, you've got physical exams and you got drug and alcohol testing that comes into play. Uh, inspection criteria are pretty much spelled out in Section 16, also in the OSHA standards. I'm not going to go into detail on them, uh, but we talk about doing inspections. You've got, you know, um, those when they come on site, those that we do daily, some we do weekly, some we do, you know, monthly, and then we do annuals. So, and the annual testing, and I'm probably getting ahead of myself a little bit, uh, can be conducted more than annually. A lot of that has to do with equipment, maybe the run times on the motors and stuff like that. They may require it more often. Uh, typically, when we bring a piece of equipment on site, uh, this is government work, they require 24 hours notice, and this is in 385, but most places that I'm experienced so far, like here at Camp Lejeune, they want 48 hours before we bring a piece of LHE on, so they got time to get somebody out there to inspect it when it comes in. Uh, again, I've already talked about this, but un, un, I didn't talk about unsafe equipment, but if it's unsafe when it gets to the site, it has to sit and be be sitting there until that's corrected and it becomes a safe piece of equipment. Uh, we already talked about the shift stuff and the monthly, so I'm going to go off of that. Uh, when we load test cranes, number one, every load test is considered a critical lift. Okay, and whatever piece of equipment, if we're load testing, for an actual load or load testing for personnel, uh, it is a critical lift. Uh, and there's several things that have to happen. I'm not going to all of them, but basically testing the load, let it sit for a while. Can you swing it? Can you set it down? All those kind of things. Uh, when do we perform that? Obviously, before we start using it. Uh, if we do anything that we have to repair that has to do with the hoist or the hoisting mechanism, It'll have to be retested again, um, especially when we reconfigure cranes. Um, I've seen more, the worst crane incident I've ever seen was actually not during re reconfiguration, but it was during maintenance. Uh, and the older lattice cranes uh, used to have the ability you could overextend that boom. Now the newer ones, you can't. There's stop points that'll stop it. But this particular crane was older. Uh, I think it was about a four or 500 ton. Uh, we were working on it, building a coal plant in Louisiana. Um, and uh, when we, and it gets down to the planning process. You know, when you go in to do maintenance, you need to go into the operations manuals and make sure that you've got the plan correct on how you're gonna do that. In this case, they ended up overextending the boom. And then what do you think happened? The boom collapsed, the crane went down, uh, we got a couple people hurt. We didn't get anybody killed, thank God. Uh, but a lot of people were injured because of it. And it was just because, and it, it's usually the case when you have something with load handling equipment, there's something wrong with the plan, or we didn't do the plan, or we didn't act according to the plan. Um, I don't know how many times I've seen it where you might have a lift that's going to say it requires at a minimum four or 500 ton chokers on there. And for some reason, we can't find five, three, we can find three 500 ton chokers, but we got a three ton choker that we want to put in to fit for that last five ton choker as specified on a plan. And I've seen that happen before where that three ton choker then snapped and we lost a load. Okay. So those kind of things can happen. So we got to be on top of it uh, when we do that. Um, operator responsibilities. I mean, the key person in any lift is the operator. That's the person that's number one on the list. Uh, and that person should not engage in any activity that doesn't include operating that equipment. Uh, never leave the load when it's suspended or leave the controls when the load is suspended. Uh, and there's several things they should do in the shutdown process. Uh, make sure the bucket or the device is on the ground, releasing the clutch, making sure controls are in the off or neutral position, you know, stopping the engine and ma making sure there's no accidental travel are, are key things in that. Um, when you talk about a lift too, you usually have, you can have up to three people involved in that, okay? Probably four or more if we start looking at ground guides and other things and spotters. Um, but the operator's key, uh, if there's a lift coordinator uh, and a rigger, a lot of times the rigger is the lift coordinator uh, if you've got a smaller lift. But those people got to make sure that that load's level, uh, it's secured properly, it's balanced, uh, there's clear swing paths in it, 
Um, and people especially, you know, are clear of that swing path. Uh, communications, uh, there's several things that can happen. Uh, you know, ideally that operator and that person giving them the signals and there should be only one person giving them signals, you know, are in clear view of each other. Uh, but you might be lifting something up on top of a building and once it, it hits the side of that building, you know, that operator can't see that load anymore when they're bringing it down. So there's got to be radio communication or some kind of other visual communication that can go with. It's typically a radio, uh, but that has to happen. I mean, the only instance where there's not one person communicating is if there's an emergency situation, somebody calls a stop and then everything has to stop. OK. Uh, there's environmental considerations. Some um, key ones are probably wind is one of the biggest. Uh, typically, you'll see you know, over 20 miles per hour is a shutdown area, but that's the time when you kind of come back in and regroup with the equipment operator, the rigger, the lift supervisor, and figure out, can we still go through with this load, okay? I've been on projects where we've had to put together, you know, if you're putting up, for instance, you're putting up steel on a building, um, each piece of steel may be a different weight. So each piece of steel, you got to take in consideration the wind direction and all that kind of stuff. Uh, which, so it can be kind of technical uh, and there's things we can put together to help with that. Uh, one of the best things I've ever seen actually came from the United Kingdom. They did a study uh, 10 stories and under on wind speeds and what to lift and what kind of pieces and what the wind speeds could be. So there's stuff out there that we can pull from uh, if you need that. Um, but if we're going to go after, after we're 20 miles an hour, we need to be documenting why we did that and, and how that happens. Uh, probably our bigger one, lightning. Um, you know, if you get into EM385, um, you know, they're still in there that's 10 miles away, flashed a bang 30 minutes after the last thunder shot um, or audible visible flash. Um, there are a lot of better systems out there today that can be utilized. Uh, I know when we were building, uh, especially the new nuclear plants, um, we actually use the, the system that the PGA Tour uses, and you can get a lot more uh, close uh, with that, uh, because when you're talking about stopping work and you've got 3,000 people on a job, you know, and you scamper down 300 that are iron workers, um, and you got them on the ground for a long period of time, first of all, you want to be, you want to make sure it's safe to go back. Uh, and even this system right here, the old system, is not as accurate as the newer systems out there because you can get systems that actually you can set it up. So all the supervision, if something gets within a certain range is lightning wise, they will get an alert on their phone. OK, when it's coming, they'll also get an alert when it's clear. So these systems are actually a lot better than this, this right here, because this is very quant qualitative as far as, you know, accuracy. Um, Types of cranes, um, you know, lattice cranes, I think we're probably more familiar with uh, truck mounted, wheel mounted. Uh, if you've ever used a rigger mounted crane, ring, ringer mounted crane, uh, basically it comes around a ring. I know when we did the new nuclear plants, there's probably a crane that's probably about 10 times the size of this and had a railroad track and a counterweight was basically concrete in the ground in the center and it serviced both units that we were going to be able to be building. Uh, but typically what you'll see is you know, on the bottom there, you know, you'll see what I call a, a cherry picker. Excuse me. Let me go back one a cherry picker. And this one's actually putting together, you know, a lattice boom, you know, track crane. Uh, but, you know, we need competent people there when we're putting these things together. Uh, we're assembling or we're disassembling. Uh, and we need to make sure that we're following the manufacturer's instructions to the letter. Um, you know, this is what you'll see in the lattice. We talked about cribbing. You see this first picture on the top. You know, one of the, the spots where you can get into a lot of trouble is when you start pinning and connecting the pieces of the boom together. Uh, you have to be very accurate in how you place them in so that these fit in and you can get the, the pins in. Uh, and of course, have the right blocking and cribbing. You can see some of that down on the bottom. Uh, portal tower and pillar cranes. If you look at this top picture, uh, that's an example of a portal crane. Uh, tower cranes you'll see downtown everywhere. Uh, that's typically in high-rise construction. You'll see a lot of tower cranes. Uh, 
I actually spent two weeks in China and you won't see any cranes basically except for tower crane uh, and they scaffold most of the rest of it because it's cheaper for them to scaffold in China than to use other smaller cranes, man lifts, boom lifts. Uh, and if you've seen a pillar crane, uh, that's what it looks like. You'll see these, uh, we, we've got a couple of these here at Camp Lejeune are one are water treatment areas where they've got big, huge basins. Uh, so those are out there too. Uh, but again, when you start talking about things that are gonna have foundations, supports, rail tracks, you really have to have an RPE, basically a resident professional engineer. And when it comes to this type of work, that means a resident professional structural type engineer that understands structures. Uh, let me see. Again, uh, obviously we've got free operational tests. Uh, when we talk about, you know, when we've got more than one tower cranes, you know, they gotta be positioned so they can't come into contact with each other. Uh, I don't think we go through a season where we don't see some type of tower crane that's failed. Uh, typically it's because it's not engineered properly or the engineering is not ad administered properly with the skewering, you know, of the boom itself or the tower itself. Uh, we do use some floating type cranes. Um, I know here at Camp Lejeune, we're using equipment on floats. We've had excavators, we've had pile drivers because we've been doing work in the marinas here. Uh, so we're putting in new docks, which means we got pylons that need to go in. Um, and we've got other stuff we need to lift off in the water. And it gets a little more technical because you're on water on how to keep things level. Uh, there's bar stability calculations that are involved. And obviously the lift plans uh, can get a little bit more technical. And we've got floating, you know, low charts uh, that get involved. <clears throat> Standard rule on outriggers is they should be out the way they are, the manufacturer says they are. Uh, but sometimes you get in tighter spots where you can't bring those outriggers all the way out. So you may have to bring them in a little bit. Uh, as much as possible, we would want to make sure that those outriggers are all even. And even sometimes that doesn't happen. So you need to have you know, a competent person or an RPE involved with that. You know, and you may have to call the manufacturer to say if, if it's okay. Uh, but they all need to be so you got the right stability when we're doing these lifts. Um, you know, you've got floats or basically the bases that you put under the outriggers. Uh, they need to be obviously constructed properly to handle that outrigger coming down uh, and, to, and to basically distribute that load properly uh, so we don't get cave-ins or crushing things that happen uh, when they're utilized. Um, you may see overhead gantry cranes. These are typically inside a building. Um, we are actually going to install uh, some overhead gantry cranes here at Camp Lejeune. Uh, those bids just went out. Uh, I think we've got a five ton, a three ton. Um, that'll go up in one of the buildings here uh, sooner or later. We're looking at the subs right now that will come and install it. But you've got smaller ones too. Uh, these ones, especially on the bottom right, uh, got to be really careful because they have my favorite thing on top of them, uh, you know, and these have ability to tip when you when you don't have if you got too much of a load. So you really got to pay attention to the manufacturer's instructions. I had a situation uh, on one project where we used a, an apparatus similar to this. Uh, it was one where each time they did an outage, it was at a fossil plant. We would take doors off that weighed a couple thousand pounds and we'd take them and we'd put new seals on them and then we'd put them back on. So you had to traverse them so far. Uh, they ended up getting on une uneven ground. We probably did this 600 times without failure. Um, and then one time, one of the bottom ends got caught in a depression. The thing tipped and it crushed somebody against the wall. They didn't, they didn't die, but they got, they got pretty banged up. And when we went back and we looked at the manufacturer's instructions, what do you think it told us? It told us that we were doing it wrong the whole time. So we got away with it 600 times. And on 601, we got bit and somebody got hurt because of it, because we didn't. And nine times out of 10, people are not looking at these manufacturer's instructions properly in their planning process. So that's something to really key on uh, when anything you do. Uh, you know, the other exception here is floor operated cranes. Uh, you got to have signals. Uh, and they gotta be pretty, if you look at the top here, 
you know, that individual's on the bottom. He's got a basically a power traveling mechanism that he's using to operate that, that crane uh, and that mechanism from the bottom. Uh, there's monorail and underhung cranes. Here's a couple examples right here, but you'll look at, you know, um, you've got our device for lifting. Uh, but the, the underhung cranes are basically, they may be inside the building, but they've got another framework underneath the ceiling. Uh, rotocraft loads, we've talked about these again, but you know, you start talking about rotocrafts, you've got FAA regulations, you got extended lift plans, you've got approvals, and you've got people on the ground, you know, from the point they take off to the point where they pick up to the point where they come back, where there should be nothing underneath as they travel. So that's when you get the local police involved. Um, you get the, you know, the, you might be in a plant where you're doing that kind of thing, uh, or it might be outside too. I don't know if we're doing any of that stuff with China Lake with some of the debris we're picking up, uh, but that, that might be something that happens. Uh, forklifts, my favorites. You know, we got a couple of pictures here of not what to do with things that happen. Um, but, you know, you hoist loads that the equipment manufacturer can do. You know, if you're going to put a load on a forklift, you're going to travel with it. You need to try to secure it as much as possible uh, so it can't fall off. Um, again, this is another situation where the person has to be certified. You know, have to have forklift operator training. You got to have a forklift card. There has to be a written test. There has to be practicals on the piece of equipment that you're going to utilize. Uh, pile driving. You know, you have the actual pile driver itself, which has its own inherent issues. I mean, if you get close to a pile driver right when it's coming down and it's doing a pile driving, you can be at 130 decibels from a hearing standpoint. So there's a hearing issue. Uh, there's an issue of things getting contacted so hard that little pieces can splinter off. So there's all kinds of things with pile drivers. We've used them here at Camp Resume. Uh, we have a wastewater treatment where we're putting in vaults uh, in new lift stations. So we've had pile drivers around all of these when we first put them in before we start forming concrete. Uh, we've put pylons out there in the water uh, where we've been doing some of our marina work. But you put it in and then you got to take it out. OK, and typically when you take it out, if the crane itself is not rated enough to pull these out, typically you have a vibrator and that's you can't see it too well with this picture, uh, but it's the piece that's right in the middle there. You bring it down, you attach it to the sheet piling itself, um, and it's typically got a remote hand operated switch that somebody on the ground is operating, not the operator themselves of the crane, uh, but it vibrates it, starts pulling it out, and that, that's how we get that stuff out. Uh, obviously, that has to be done on the, under the, the guise of a competent person, trained operator. And the operator himself has to be trained on the pile driver and the, and the, and the vibrator. Um, again, and you're not supposed to exceed the road load rating of the equipment. That's typically why we're using a vibrator when we use that type of equipment. OK, moving on to lift plans. And this is probably the biggest key here. You know, all lifts, I don't care how small they are. Like I said, most of the most significant incidents I've seen in my career have been 20,000 pounds and under. And it's because of number one, they didn't have a plan or number two, they didn't follow the plan that they had. OK, they took shortcuts on the plan. Um, obviously, critical lifts, will, it, it, they need a little bit of additional effort. Uh, and we have some OSHA and state regulations, probably like Cal OSHA, uh, that are more restrictive than our own SOP. I know EM385 is in a lot of areas. Um, if you even look at Section 16, uh, there's 85 pages in section 16 on, on load handling equipment. I didn't go through all the details. If I went through all the details, we'd be here probably for two days going through all of that, okay? So this is just a brief overview. So any crane, the types of cranes that we have talked about, the types of load handling equipment we've talked about, you need to get into the manufacturer. You need to get into 385 and look in a specific section. If you're using a lattice crane boom, you know, if you're using a pillar crane, if you're on the water, you need to go back and refresh yourself into what that says because it's very detailed inside of 385. Specifically, you also have a lot of details in the OSHA standards. Um, critical lifts. You know, sometimes we figure it as that's yeah, only 75% or greater of the load. Well, it's not. If we're lifting hazardous materials, it's a critical lift. 
If we're hoisting personnel, it becomes a critical lift. Uh, if we're using more than one piece of load handling equipment to make that lift, it becomes a critical lift. Uh, if you have issues where the center of gravity could change, it becomes a critical lift. 75% we've already talked about. Uh, if you're not using the outriggers with a piece of equipment, it becomes a critical lift. We're not done yet. Uh, more than one hoist, multiple lift rigging assemblies. Uh, if the load is submerged, uh, if the lift is going to get out of the operator's view, okay? For example, if you're lifting on top of a building, you might be, somebody might be having a new air handling unit, a new air conditioning unit, we're putting it on top of a building. Well, once that crane operator gets it past there and it goes over, they're going to lose sight as they put it down, okay? So it becomes a critical lift. Um, Land-based LHE mounted barges, pontoons, uh, and, you know, the final one is if that operator feels that lift is critical for whatever reason, it becomes a critical lift. Um, hoisting and rigging plans. Uh, if we look into, and I'm not going to details because you can pull these up on the SOP, we have a rigging ordinary plan uh, within our safety SOP for ECC uh, that's fairly detailed. Uh, you can go through it in detail. Uh, there's also one for critical lifts. Um, now, a lot of times, you know, we get into right here for us at Camp Lejeune, or if you're under EM385, there's very specific things that have to happen. Uh, here, we have one person, uh, Mitch Myers, who's one of our construction managers. Uh, he's the only one that puts the lift plans together for cranes or critical lifts uh, of any size. Uh, and we have to submit those to NAFAC here uh, before we actually even bring the piece of equipment on site. That plan has had to be in, to, in processed and it needs to be approved when we look at it. And, and, the, and the next couple of slides are basically an example. Uh, if we look at a crane lift plan here, we need to submit our guys to a guy named Ricky Baggs. Okay. He is their lift coordinator. And this is for, you know, all of Camp Lejeune, which means Camp Lejeune proper, uh, the other side, which is New River, where the air base is, and then we have Camp Geiger, which is over on the New River side. So if you look at that area, and from an OSHA standpoint, they call it a designated geographic area, and we're losing that for the BPP. Uh, it's about the size of Rhode Island when you look at this entire base. So it's very big, and we can be all over this base. Um, the ET for NAFAC, uh, overseeing the project also needs to review the AHA prior to the lift, but that's basic. They do that with all the AHA, so that's just kind of an easy one. Um, there's a certificate of compliance that gets filled out. Basically, you know, who the contacts are, what the piece of equipment is, what the serial numbers are. Um, then we get into a myriad of questions when it comes in and it gets che checked out. Uh, we typically have to give them 48 hours notice before we bring a piece of LHE onto this base, uh, you know, and the EM-385 says 24 hours, but they're asking for 48 here so they can coordinate getting the right person there uh, to actually do the initial check-in on any load handling equipment we bring in. Uh, with a crane, there's a crane checklist. You can see that there, all the questions. Um, you know, it continues. Uh, it's, pro it's three pages, so it's fairly detailed when the crane gets checked in. It needs to get checked in when it first comes in. Uh, or if we take it from one site on the base to another and we're taking it apart and then we got it and we're reconfiguring it when we get to the next spot, it will have to be checked out with the same process again. Okay. Uh, there's a daily checklist that goes with it uh, that we owe the government. Uh, but, you know, we have our own daily checklist that we'd be using anyway for the equipment inspection if we were on a commercial job, hazardous waste job. You know, hazardous waste jobs is basically doing the same thing a lot of times with a respirator on. Uh, so um, that's that. Uh, this is an example here of an annual inspection. Now, annual inspections are annual, but if something happens to that piece of equipment, say, for example, um, somebody backs into the, uh, the crane uh, with another piece of equipment and may have done some damage to that crane, you may have to have somebody come out and do an annual inspection. And annual inspections from a third party are not cheap, okay? 
Uh, I, I've seen some that are upwards of sixty, seventy thousand dollars for larger cranes. So it's it's not a cheap process, uh, but it needs to be done. Uh, there are times when it has to be done, you know, less than annually, depending on what happens. You know, if you change out something that is part of the hoisting process for that crane, they're going to need to have another inspection done. So those kind of things are there. Um, you know, load testing. We talked about load testing when you have to do it. Um, we've already talked about that, so I'm not going to do that. You got to put some diagrams in these usually uh, with what we're going to do and how we're going to lift it periodically, what kind of lifts we're going to do. And then obviously, you know, the certifications of the crane operator uh, or the operator, if it's a front end loader, uh, a, a backhoe that we're using to do the lift, you know, what's what's the lift plan that we have to do go through. So and then, OK. I guess that's that's it for for what I had to present. So we'll kind of open it up for questions, Q and A. Nobody. Anybody still there? Yeah. Does anybody have any questions about uh, lift plans in particular? Sometimes people have a little trouble with those uh, determining exactly what is needed. Um, if you don't want to ask a question now, feel free to call Bob. Uh, if he's not available, you can call me. And uh, uh, if you have any questions on lift plants and critical lifts and good things like that. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest thing is making sure that there is a plan. Because again, nine times out of 10, in my experience, you know, when we had a, a lifting incident, uh, either there wasn't a plan because they thought it was just such a small lift that it didn't need a plan. Uh, or the plan was not followed properly, even if it was put together. The best plan, if it's not followed, you know, you, you're leaving yourself open for something to happen. Right. One thing I notice, uh, I see quite a bit on television, is um, you see a lot of these tree removal companies now. They used to climb them previously, but now they have access to these uh, mobile hydraulic cranes. And uh, a lot of the tree companies are using them for neighborhood removals to lift trees over houses, that type of thing. And I guarantee you that none of them do lift plans. They just do it off the seat of their pants. And it seems like every week I see a picture on the television news where a crane is tipped over trying to lift either a tree or a piece of a tree. Uh, and that's a perfect example of what happens if you don't have a lift plan. Um, and some of the newer cranes, they actually have um, systems that will prevent a crane from lifting something that it shouldn't be lifting in a certain configuration. But even with that, you can't depend on that. That's more of a redundancy type of a situation, you know, fail safe. But, um, you know, so even if you have a, a, a small item, um, you really need to do a lift plan so that you can make sure it stays upright, basically. Okay, I see, Vitrina, you had a question? Yes, sir. I, I, more of a statement. Um, when um, we were working in Oregon, um, in California, they actually um, drive the ball of the crane to cut trees. And so that was something different um, that we kind of were going through when we were trying to get the critical lift plan. The lift plan it actually was a crane um, um, and they had it. They want to ride the ball to cut trees. So that was something different that I experienced. Yeah, but they, they, they can't ride the ball. They could do a man basket. No, didn't, uh, Vitrina, this is Pete, didn't um, Cal OSHA allow them to do that? Wasn't that in the yes. regulations? Was there, okay, so they got an exemption based on emergency? Uh, not necessarily emergency. That's just, a, that's their normal and customary way to do it. Okay. For, for, for tree work only. Yeah, for tree okay. work only. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. And so that was something different that I um, got the experience out here. It was really really different so how were they tied off they were tied off to the um um actual to the to the um with they had a, a heck i can't even think of the name of it now but it was a weird way because they cut they cut the tree and the tree was they they get up and tie the tree off the, the part that they cut off and then that part is lifting up and they're still step they're still hanging there it's it's really different. It's um it was uh yeah so <laughs> hmm. yeah so, California allows 
Oh, it's definitely dangerous, but it's but that's their that's the way that they've de um, determined that they're the best way to do it because it keeps the 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 climber from being fatigued from climbing up the tree actually, because see a lot of times they get tired from climbing the tree to cut it, and and that's what that's where that's why they um made the exception, because they don't they're not the, the worker is not fatigued and they have um they do it like um, in tandem they have two people that go and do it. So they don't they don't get tired doing it. They just able to cut the tree and come back down. So okay. that, I guess that's what I mean. Deception. I would assume then that they went through the actual variance process and got an approval that way. Must be, yeah. yeah they, well, that's the, there's a provision in the OSHA standards for a variance and how you get it. So yeah. So that was just something different that I experienced. I just thought I'd mention. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, Pete, back to you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Bob. That was excellent. And like I mentioned uh, before, uh, there will be a quiz online next week, and we'll let you know when that gets put up. And you want to make sure you do the quiz because that's how we're going to determine if you um, participated in the training. So any other questions before we conclude? Okay, thanks again, Bob. Really appreciate it. It was excellent. Thank you, Bob. My pleasure, Pete.